I'm Christina from Soundwalkers, and I want to welcome you to our virtual field trip, part of our series on climate change. Before I introduce my colleague Jess, who will be leading you through this virtual field trip, I want to make sure you have viewed our video on greenhouse gases. Understanding greenhouse gases and how they influence climate change is an important prerequisite to the subjects in this series. So I encourage you to pause now, view greenhouse gases, and come back to learn more from this video. I'm sure you will enjoy learning all about climate change, how it affects our environment, and things you can do to mitigate the damaging effects. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague and friend, Jess. The concentration of atmospheric carbon dioxide has been increasing since the start of the Industrial Revolution. This increase has been causing the pH of the surface ocean to drop. It has fallen by 0.1 pH units. And this drop is increasing the acidity of the ocean in a process known as ocean acidification. Before we dive into the science behind ocean acidification, let's quickly review pH. The pH scale is a logarithmic scale that goes from zero all the way up to 14, with seven in the middle being neutral. It tells us whether something is an acid or a base. And what it's really talking about is the concentration of free hydrogen ions in a solution. So if you're below seven, it's an acid, and there are higher hydrogen ion concentrations than in pure water. If it's a base, it's from 7 to 14, and there are lower concentrations of hydrogen ions in the solution. To better understand this, we're going to dive into some of the acid-base properties of water. In a solution, a small percentage of water molecules spontaneously dissociate in a process known as the auto-ionization of water. The oxygen atom is greedy, and it always hogs the electron in its covalent bond with the hydrogen atoms, pulling them away from the hydrogen atoms, and this gives the oxygen a partial negative charge and the two hydrogen atoms a partial positive charge. Sometimes the oxygen atom goes so far as to grab both of the electrons from its covalent bond with the hydrogen atom. This leaves the hydrogen without its electron. It only has a proton, which gives it a positive charge. So this reaction creates a hydroxide ion and a hydrogen ion. The concentration of hydrogen ions produced by autoionization in pure water is one times 10 to the negative seven molar. Solutions are classified as either an acid or a base based on their hydrogen ion concentration relative to pure water. It can get pretty messy looking at these numbers. And this is where pH comes into play. The hydrogen ion concentration of a solution is expressed in terms of pH. And pH is calculated as the negative log of a solution's hydrogen ion concentration. When we plug the values for orange juice, pure water, and bleach into this equation, we get a pH of 4, 7, and 12, respectively. The 7 we receive for pure water is the neutral value. Orange juice has a value below pure water. So it has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions and is acidic. Bleach, on the other hand, has a value above pure water, has a lower concentration of hydrogen ions and is basic. The pH scale ranks the acidity or basicity of a substance. Sometimes basis, basic substances are also referred to as an alkaline substance. Now every move we make on our pH scale increases or decreases the concentration of hydrogen ions by 10 times. So each step we take closer to zero on the scale means there's 10 times more hydrogen ions in the substance, making it 10 times more acidic. Now that we understand that, let's think back to that 0.1 pH drop we have seen in surface ocean waters. That 0.1 drop in the last 200 years is an increase of 30% in the acidity of ocean waters. How does an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations affect the pH of the ocean? The ocean is a huge carbon sink. It interacts with the atmosphere across its whole surface, and it absorbs up to 30% of the atmospheric carbon dioxide released from human activity. When it's absorbed into the ocean, carbon dioxide undergoes a series of chemical reactions that results in the release of hydrogen ions into the ocean. Let's break down the reaction carbon dioxide undergoes in seawater. When carbon dioxide gets pulled into the ocean by the waves, it mixes with the water. The water molecules and the carbon dioxide molecules interact and combine. 
Together, they create carbonic acid. Now, carbonic acid is a weak acid that easily dissociates into bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. The addition of these hydrogen ions to the water increases its acidity. This process is known as ocean acidification and is causing the pH of the water to lower. Ocean acidification is already having an impact on many marine species. It is especially affecting organisms that create hard shells and skeletons by combining calcium and carbonate from the water, such as corals, oysters, and some plankton species. Typically, these calcifying organisms, such as the oyster larva seen here, gather carbonate ions from the water, attracting them with their calcium ions. The excess hydrogen in the water are more reactive than the calcium ions. The more reactive hydrogen ions steal the carbon ions from the calcifying organisms. The reaction of the hydrogen and carbonate ions forms bicarbonate. It locks the carbonate ions away from the calcifying organisms, making it much more difficult and near impossible for these organisms to create their shells. One such calcifying organism lives right here in our backyard in Long Island Sound. You may have seen oysters on your dinner plate before, but they are extremely important to the health of Long Island Sound. Oysters are filter feeders. That means they bring in water to eat, take out the plankton they need to eat from the water. And while they do that, they also filter the water. An adult oyster can filter 50 gallons of water a day. And this removes different toxins from the water. They either keep it inside their body or deposit it onto the bottom of the water. And they also provide a habitat for other creatures to hide in from their predators. When a oyster larva is hatched into acidic waters with carbonate in short supply, they can't build their hard shell they need to survive. The chances of that juvenile oyster surviving are low. Ocean acidification also affects adult oysters. As oysters grow, they need to be able to pull carbonate out of the water to continue the growing of their shell. They need to expend more energy to find carbonate in acidic waters which takes away the energy they need to grow, to reproduce, to fight off pathogens, makes it much harder for them to survive. And when the water gets too acidic, it can even eat away at their shells. To explore this notion a little bit more, we're going to set up an experiment. We're going to be doing an experiment to see how an acidic solution can have an effect on three different types of shells. To do that, we need to gather all of our supplies. And if you'd like to follow along with me, you can find the instructions and the lab book in your supporting materials packet. So what I have here is I have six mason jars, each of which I have labeled with the condition, which is either brackish water or vinegar, as well as which type of shell I'm putting into that jar. I also have gathered two of each of my shells I will be testing. So I have two jingle shells, two clam shells, and two oyster shells. Then I also have a scale to measure each of my shells before and during the experiment, and a beaker that measures at least 200 milliliters to use to pour out my solutions. Now that I have all of my materials, I'm ready to get started. But before we do that, I'd like you to make a hypothesis. Think about what you think will happen to each of the shells when we put it into the brackish water or the vinegar. Decide what you think will happen to each one. After you've written that down, we're ready to start weighing our shells. After I weigh a shell, I'm going to put it right into the mason jar where it will be so I don't mix any of them up. Now that I have each of my shells weighed and my weight recorded, I'm ready to set up the experiment. So I'm going to use two different beakers, one specifically for the vinegar and the other specifically for the brackish water. I'm going to weigh out 200 milliliters of each solution and pour it in on top of the shells. And now my experiment is all set up and ready to go. 
I'm going to be leaving this for three days, checking in each day to reweigh the shells and see how they've changed day by day. And then we're gonna head back and talk all about it at the end of day three. All right, it's been three days that our shells have been sitting here in their solutions. And as I said, I would, I checked on them at the end of day one. That means there was a little bit of a change in some of the vinegar ones. And I remember when I looked at them, I could see the bubbles rising off of the shells. You can actually see the vinegar kind of eating away at the strength of the shell. Then I came back yesterday on day two and we saw an even more substantial decrease in the weight of each shell. Now that it is the end of day three, I'm ready to weigh them again. And each time that I weighed them, I used some paper towels to try to pat off any of the excess liquid so I didn't get too much of a variation in the weight. I really just got the weight of the shell. So I would suggest you do the same. And I also used tweezers to pick them up so I didn't need to stick my fingers into the solutions. So let's see how much they weigh now. So if we take a look at the numbers that we got on our third day, on our last day, we can see that the anything, any of the shells that were in water had no change at all. They were the same weight as they started, but the oyster and vinegar went from 4.85 grams all the way down to 1.55. The clam went from 5.29 to 1.86, and the jingle shell went from 1.59 to 0.64. They cause substantial decreases in the weight of the shell due to the acidity of the vinegar eating away at the shell. Now, while the ocean is not going to get as acidic, hopefully, as the vinegar, vinegar is a very low acidity, so it's a very strong acid, and the ocean's not going to get that strong, but the changes in the acidification of the ocean will have a great effect on the strength of these shells. These calcifying organisms we've been talking about play a major role in the Long Island Sound food web. With the survival of these organisms in question, the stability of our food web comes into question as well. What would happen if these organisms were removed? There would be a lot of plankton in the water with one less predator eating them, and there would be one less prey for those animals that rely on calcifying organisms as their food, such as sea stars, different fish species, and gulls. And how would the removal have an effect on the human population? A lot of people rely on the oyster industry for their sustainability. They rely on it for money. It plays a major role in the economics of both New York and Connecticut. With the removal of these organisms, there could be less stability for a lot of families. Some families rely on recreational oystering or clamming for a food source. Scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Lab in Milford, Connecticut are doing research on how ocean acidification can affect some commonly found Long Island Sound animals. They're specifically looking at plankton species, shellfish species, and finfish. Plankton are those organisms at the bottom of the food web. So many things rely on them as a food source. Any effect they feel from ocean acidification can ripple up the food chain. And shellfish are those creatures we've been talking about so much with their hard shell. They use the carbonate in the water to create this shell. If there's not enough in the, around them, they might not be able to create a hard shell. And that's what scientists are looking at here. And the fin fish, they could be affected in their growth rate, in the number of eggs they produce, in their otolith development. And all of these scientists wanna figure out what could happen. I am here in Milford with Shannon Nizek, who is a NOAA senior researcher with the NOAA Marine Fisheries Lab in Milford. Thank you for joining us today, Shannon. Thank you for having me. Awesome. If you want to just kind of introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Thanks. Um, I'm Shannon Misek. I work at NOAA Fisheries in Milford, Connecticut. I've been there since 2002. Um, I started my degree at SUNY Plattsburgh in environmental science and chemistry. Uh, with, from there, I ended up going to Old Dominion University and studying chemical oceanography. And I immediately went from that with my PhD to uh, NOAA Fisheries in Milford. I've been working on how the environment, and 
specifically chemistry affects um, bivalves. And lately I've been focusing on ocean acidification. Awesome. So this whole lesson has been about ocean acidification and we've learned about what it is and a little bit about how it can affect the animals. Um, so maybe if you can go into a little bit more on the research that the lab is doing on ocean acidification, that would be awesome. Yeah, the lab started doing research on ocean acidification in about 2009. We started with phytoplankton species and um, finfish species, but the lab has a long history of working with bivalves. It started in 1931 with Dr. Lusanoff when we were started with looking at what was going on with oysters. And we've continued a lot of our ocean acidification research looking at the response to um, bivalves. Bivalves are really important because they have a calcium carbonate shell. And under ocean acidification, it's going to be harder for those organisms that have a shell to potentially make them. Um, so we've focused on oysters, blue mussels, surf clams, and sea scallops. And that's what we've been doing research on. Cool. Awesome. So what kind of implications does your research have on the organism specifically in Long Island Sound? So one of the projects that I just finished this summer, we started it in July and uh, finished it in October. We exposed the eastern oyster, which is native to Connecticut and is a, a big part of the aquaculture industry here, um, to varying levels of carbon dioxide. We had three treatments. We had current conditions, which is about 500 ppms. We had future projections of 1200 ppms. And we had levels that are well beyond the pr current predictions of 2300 ppms. And that is, those levels would only be held, would only be reached if we did not reduce some of our CO2 emissions. And the idea behind this was to look and see what was going on with growth. Did we see changes in tissue weight? Did we see changes in the shell length? Did we see changes in the color of the shells? And we also looked to see how were they, they were breathing. Did they breathe differently under ocean acidification? And did they excrete differently? And did they feed differently? And so I've got some shells here that I wanted to show you. And the reason I picked these shells is this is our ambient condition. And I don't know if you can see, it's looks like a normal oyster shell. It's got color on it. It's got nice cupping. The shell is really nice in color. And this is our highest treatment. Oh, wow. And if you notice, it's very white and most of the color on it is gone. And this is four weeks into the experiment. Um, so what we did observe was that the shells were thinner on uh, oysters that were exposed to high CO2. We also saw some differences in weights of the tissues. We then take this data and we put it into a model to predict, and this model is known as a dynamic energy budget model, and what it does is it allows us to determine how much longer it would take an oyster to reach maturity or harvest size. We define maturity as when they release um, eggs um, so they can reproduce. And what we see is depending on when the oyster is first put in Long Island Sound, that it can take anywhere from two months longer, depending on the condition, up to a year longer, um, depending on what the CO2 concentration is. So this can help us understand how the organism may respond to changing conditions. That's really cool. That, that's a crazy difference in the color of those shells. It is. We've also seen this same difference in surf clams. And for surf clams, in oysters, we didn't see a difference in length, meaning that even though their shell was changing, they were still growing at the same rate. For surf clams, we actually did see a difference um, in shell growth, and we also saw the color dis differences. And at the end of the experiment, we actually um, had holes in the shell and surf clams are still native to Long Island Sound and there is still a fishery so it, there could be implications to the surf clams that are located in Long Island Sound. Huh. Interesting. What kind of effect do you think there will be any effect on the human population around Long Island Sound? The, there, there will be some effects. Some of the things that are happening with ocean acidification um, are you're having changes in dynamics and um, one of the 
things that could happen is their food sources could be uh, affected. If it takes longer for organisms like oysters to grow, to get the tissue weight they want or to reproduce, it could change how much food is actually available. Um, bivalves are one of the most profitable uh, industries for the U.S. Um, the sea scallop makes over 550 mil million million I can't remember if it's million or billion um, and New Bedford is the largest port for uh, sea scallops if that industry needs a longer time to actually grow to harvest size it would affect the amount of food we were getting and it would also affect the US economy so that's why studying how marine organisms especially shellfish are responding to ocean acidification is so important Awesome. So what was one thing you would suggest to students that want to change something in their everyday lives to try and make a difference? So the easiest thing to do is to buy locally. Go to the local farmer's market. You don't think about it when you go to the grocery store, but when you're buying something that's being produced in, um, far away, even if it's from California, apples in California versus apples that are coming from Shelton, Connecticut, you have to transport that and that's using vehicles and other forms of transportation that release co2 and that distance is much greater so if you can buy goods locally you're already reducing some of the co2 emissions and not only are you reducing some of the co2 emissions for transportation you're also helping the local economy so that's the number one thing you could do awesome thank you so much shannon for coming out with us today thanks a Connecticut-based organization called Project Oceanology has found that the pH in Long Island Sound has declined more than it has in the open ocean. The average pH of Long Island Sound is 7.8, while in the open ocean it's 8.1. In coastal areas such as Long Island Sound, acidification can be magnified because of nutrient runoff from the land. Things like phosphate and nitrogen can increase acidification coastally. So we just wrapped up our conversation with Shannon and in doing so, we kind of asked a follow-up question and she gave us some really awesome details on specifically Long Island Sound. Shannon, would you mind sharing that again? Yeah, no problem. So what we were discussing is that areas like Long Island Sound um, would be classified as having uh, coastal acidification. Coastal acidification also has a component slightly different than ocean acidification. We know ocean acidification is carbon dioxide coming in from the atmosphere. With coastal acidification, you also have excess runoff uh, that brings nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, and those excess nutrients end up causing large algal blooms. And what can happen is these algal blooms can end up creating a swing in the carbon dioxide in the water so that you have high pHs and then low pHs, especially when it degrades. So that's known as, that's um, part of coastal acidification. And Long Island Sound with uh, excess nutrients would really qualify as uh, coastal acidification. Now, one thing you can do to um, help with coastal acidification is really try to reduce um, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that could get into the waterway. So one way to do that is if it's going to be a really heavy rain event, don't put as much fertilizer down. Or if you uh, think your lawn needs for fertilizer, put a little bit down first and see if it responds before you dump all of it. Also try buying products that don't have a lot of phosphorus and nutrient phosphorus and nitrate in it like soaps and shampoos and all of that will help lower coastal acidification that is occurring along Long Island Sound in, in some areas. Awesome thank you so much again Shannon we really appreciate you coming out. Thank you! <laughs> Ocean acidification is a global issue with a local impact. The decrease in pH or increase in acidity will have an effect on many marine ecosystems. Organisms will be greatly affected, removing certain things out of the food web, which will have a ripple effect throughout. It'll even ripple up to humans. It'll affect the food source for us, as well as the livelihood of many fishermen. It is so important for all communities around the globe to do their best to reduce our carbon emissions to help lessen the impacts of ocean acidification.